find Psalms 23. And while you're find, finding that, I just want to say something to you that uh, totally uh, struck my heart uh, this last week. Um, a moment in time with God in the middle of the night. I awaken from a dream, and I dream in this, I'm in this church, this church here, the sanctuary. There are kids everywhere, kids, young people, but kids, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years old, and then some teenagers, but a lot of the little kids, and the Spirit of God was moving on these little kids. And some of them were slaying the Spirit. Some of them were laying on hands on others for healing. I was prophesying over some of them. And there was this, this, this kind of God roar in the room. And when I woke up, the anointing in the room was so strong. And I thought, that's what I'm talking about right there. I don't know if God's done with us old people. But, um, but it's about, it, he's not done with us. But he knows that we have to make the transition to equip and train and give space and room for even the least among us. Jesus made that very clear and set that, set that line when he said the disciples, when they were trying to do church together, hey, he put little kids in his lap and they were annoyed because he broke protocol. And he said, no, no, you don't get it. Such is the kingdom of God unless you're like little children. So I don't know what that means all other than I don't think that we have yet found the apex of our destiny in this church. And a part of that has to do not just with the next generation, but with children. And not only with children, but children who are moving in the supernatural, the power of God, have healing anointing. People will come here to be prayed for by little kids. That's what I felt. And I feel it as I'm saying it uh, this morning. And that gave me such hope. I have such hope. I have such hope. Uh, I have some hope for all of us, but I had greater hope for the younger generation. And, uh, and I have wonderful hope for you. Anyway, Psalms, uh, Psalms uh, 93, we'll make the transition here. There are times when, um, there are a lot of time, most of the time when uh, you feel like you have something from the Lord to say if you're a speaker, if you're entitled enough to um, uh, bring a message. Uh, but the difference between getting, getting something from the Lord and the delivery sometimes is not, not on the same plane. And uh, so I'm hoping for a delivery that is uh, equal to what the Lord said to me, spoke to me last night. I didn't think I was going to do this morning. I thought, well, I'll, I'll have someone else do this. But... Um, I, I had a change of heart because of something in my heart. The Lord uh, dropped in my heart. And I want you to hear this, and I want to say it with a very heartfelt uh, and honest and open and, and uh, encouraging uh, presentation. And um, so in Psalms 23, and let me tell you just a minute about Psalms 23. Um, but let me, before that, let me say, I, I believe that we're lost in space and time. And as a world and a church, we need a real point of reference. We need a point. We need a GPS, which is a global positioning system. We need a spiritual GPS. Now, a GPS is satellites in the atmosphere of the natural that give you a position and proximity to where you're at on Earth. I think we've lost our GPS system in the spirit to some degree. And it's nobody's fault other than there's been a major storm that have knocked out the spiritual, spiritual grid around us. And we really are flying blind in a lot of ways. So we need a point of reference. And so I feel the Lord spoke that to me yesterday, and he said, I said, Lord, what would that be? Since he's much smarter than me, he wrote a bigger book than I did. And I said, Lord, what would that be? And instantly I knew what that GPS reference is, and it's Psalms chapter 23. And the reason I know that is because it was, uh, it was during uh, 3,000 years ago in the reign of David. Uh, some theologian says at the beginning of his reign, and others say at the end, but it leans toward the beginning when he was battle-weary. When Saul was trying to kill him and he was trying to make a transition into becoming uh, a leader of the kingdom uh, at that time and to transition it into a to God peace God had imagined it to become. Uh, but, uh, but boy, was he, was he sort of lost in space and time. And he was embattled on every, every side. And it is out of this distress and out of this heart, the sense of being lost and reaching out for God that David in his solitary place wrote Psalms 23. 3,000 years ago, and it still speaks so loudly to me and clearly to me. And so I just want to draw through some of the uh, verses here and just share a few things that not only are biblically uh, founded and, and we can expound on, but personally personally embedded in my spirit because the Lord had visited me several times out of Psalms 23, one time 
for a long time, for over an hour. He, his presence stood in my room at my bed and walked me through Psalms 93. It was most, the most amazing time in my life. That was only seven, eight years ago, and I'm still reliving that and still still trying to assimilate that. And so, uh, uh, so let's just do it. Let's just begin in verse 1. And I just want to drop through the verses again. Some of them will we'll extrapolate. Some of them will just make a drive-by. Um, but one, this is a real amazing one. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, I want to give you a GPS fix for this. I want you to get this. You have to get If you don't get this, you won't get the rest of them. David is saying, in my distress, in my time of being lost in space and time and and gifting and calling. He was lost. He was just struggling to survive in battle by the worst of the worst of enemies. But he said this in his time of distress, I have to, I have to position myself with this understanding. In spite of all the stuff that's going on in your life, in spite of the stuff that's going on in our life, like David, we have to remember that the Lord is our shepherd. And that's a big deal. We're the sheep of his pastor. He's our shepherd, and I love this piece, after he said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And when you look into some of the original context of the word I want, uh, some of the translations better say, I shall never suffer lack or suffer any lack at all. So the Lord is our shepherd, we shall never suffer lack. And on a sheep, what is it that a sheep would suffer if it was taken away from them that would endanger them? You think it would be their fleece. And all to say, the Lord is never going to let you be sheared beyond what you're able to stand. Do you hear me? I, we feel like we've been stripped. And a good shepherd will shear the sheep, but he won't take them beyond what they can stand. He will leave enough wool to at least get them through the season. And I know it's been a difficult season, and I know that we have somewhat dis, kind of disbelieved the Lord is our shepherd because it feels like we have been skinned alive. And uh, But David set the record right when he said, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall never, never suffer a lack of wool to keep me warm. And by the way, that wool, that weightiness, that wool brought them through the winter. So he is the Lord, and he knows you as, your, as a sheep, and he knows how much to take from you and how much to leave on you. So we really got to trust the Lord that he will not put on us more than we can bear or take away from us more than we can ever stand. He is smarter than us, a shepherd is smarter than a sheep. That's why he's the shepherd. But not only that, by the way, the Lord is my shepherd only to the degree that I am his sheep. We want the Lord to be our shepherd, but to be a shepherd, that means you have to become sheep-like. That means you have to learn to follow. That means you have to learn to trust. That means you have to learn to obey. And the season that we're in in this world, it's hard to follow, trust, and obey, frankly. But here's what John said about that in John 10. For the good shepherd has laid down his life for the sheep. So you and I are utmost in what he's all about. For he forever lives to make intercession for his sheep. We are his flock and the sheep of his pastor. If that is true, he's not forgotten us or cast us aside. Although the storm is great, although we can't hear, we can't see, we can't fly, it seems like everything is going wrong, we have a good shepherd who has laid down his life and has given, given up everything he had for us. And listen, he's made an investment for us and given that up, and he's not going to lose that investment in you. You and I are going to make it through this time. Hebrews 4.15 says this is a reason we're going to make it through this time that we're in because the great shepherd, according to Hebrews 14, he's touched with the feeling of our weaknesses. His touch, in other words, his heart is big with the feeling of our weaknesses uh, and our infirmities. So I have to take that as the word of God. There it is right there, natural. And a couple of years ago, it was really, really amplified in my life by a mini visitation in the middle of the night a few years ago. And I wake up uh, and um, the presence of the Lord is in the room. I don't see the Lord. There's times in the past I have. Many times the Lord has come to me and talked to me and, and uh, out of my sleep. Uh, when I wake up, I'm asleep. I, w I was out of sleep, but it wasn't a natural voice, but it was the presence of the Lord, and it was a, a voice that filled the room. And it was so simple. He just said, Larry, I want you to know two things. Three things. Maybe he said three things. One, I love you. 
I've always loved you, and I'm still here with you. It sounds so simple and so maybe trite and so like soft candy, but listen, right now where we're at, we need to know that someone loves us. We need to know that someone would give their life for us, which he did, and that would embrace us and that we're, and is touched with every feeling. And I don't know about you, but feelings, nothing more than feelings, have really about knocked me to the ground. I mean, that was a song, in case you didn't know. But feelings, wow, we are a people of feelings. And I don't know about you, if you're at all any sensitive in the Lord and you're a feeler, you're really in trouble right now. I'm feeling everything. It's like, my, I just felt that mosquito die when it hit the ground. Like, oh, my God. It's like all this. Go- we watch TV, and I go TV. I'm going, my feeler is worn out. And I, I literally cry. I, I, I go, Lord, please help this world. Help us. But he loves us. And love never, ever fails, or love, love never, ever has a, uh, is without a plan of escape from your torment. Love always covers. Love always encourages. And that's who he is. The shepherd loves the sheep. And I want you to get that right. No matter what's going on in the world or what you think is going to happen, the bottom line is the shepherd loves his church. He loves the sheep. He loves who we are. And he will not let us go into perdition or destruction as it seems like we're going to because the good shepherd owns us because he bought us with his blood on Calvary. He owns us. He will not let his sheep be diminished, no matter what it looks like. So the spiritual high ground, in my opinion, is not how much I love him. The spiritual high ground is how much he loves me. So we think it's like, it's all about, well, how much I love it. I got I to gotta pray more. I got to that's good. That's fine. But that's not the spiritual high ground. That is, not, that is not the essence of who we are. It is not how well you love him. It's how well he loves you. And he loves you. He loves you. He loves this nation. He loves me. He loves us in spite of what is going on. Ephesians 1.6 says, for this reason, we are accepted in the beloved. Do, do you get that? I, I don't know if you feel not accepted, but I'm feeling pretty unaccepted. And these years of my life, 73 this year, and I thought, Jesus, what's next? And then I thought, oh, 74. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought it was going that direction. I was hoping it was going the other direction. But anyway, we're accepted in the beloved. But so what does that mean? Do you we, we got to get some acceptance. Like he loves us. We're accepted. In him. Let, put it this way. Self-acceptance is not ignoring your faults and imperfections. Rather, it's acknowledging the perfection of Christ. He worked on Calvary for you. It's not about your imperfections. Never been about your imperfection. It has never been about um, anything other than acknowledging that his perfect work totally annihilates your imperfections on Calvary. He who knew no sin became sin that his sheep could be the righteousness of God in him. I'm telling you what, I don't care what you're going through or how mean you are right now, you're still righteous because he made you righteous. It's not about what you do. It's about whose you are that matters. And you are his, and we are the sheep of his pastor. Because of the cross, let me finish this one. You and I are forever caught in a divine embrace of our great shepherd. Because of Calvary, You and I are caught in a divine embrace of our great shepherd. He has gone to any lengths and will go to any lengths to make sure that we win this thing. And they would get through it and that we are the sheep of his pasture in a way that we have never experienced before. So I would encourage you that. Everybody in here needs to go, "Ah, that's I I don't... (laughs) I'm bad. I don't know what you need to do, but we need to let him know. Right now, it's pretty hard because all I can do is go, meh. But that's all right. Every shepherd that's a true shepherd is trained to hear a meh. So whatever it is that's crying, whatever you're leaking that's hard and is crying from your heart, your good shepherd is chronicling in heaven and remembering the sigh and the groan as he did with Israel. And he remembered their sigh and their groan and he said, I will come down and deliver them. And he's going to do that. So be patient. Number two, just going to touch this one quickly. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. No need to go there. But he leaves me beside still water. Just a thought about still waters. 
Still waters, actually a Hebrew word, uh, it's usually translated clear waters. Still means that you can see your reflection. When you look into water that are still waters, two things. One, you can see your reflection in it. There's not muddy, so you don't see a deformed reflection. And two, it is good for drinking. It's not poisonous. Muddy water to sheep was poisonous. So not only all this other stuff I talked about, the Lord is to us, he leads us beside clear waters. In other words, when we look into the waters, we not only get a picture of who we are, but the shepherd that stands behind us. The Lord is about to open our eyes and our vision to clear waters. And he's about to take from us the poison water that we have been drinking. We have muddied our lives with self-condemnation, with angst, with, with all the offenses, and with all the hurts and bumps and bruises and all the stuff that goes in with life. And we have muddied the waters. The Lord is about to unmuddy the waters by leading us into some clear waters. I believe that for us, and I believe that for this nation. Number three, this is probably my favorite of all favorites, except for all the others. Number three, he restores my soul. He restores my soul. Interesting word, the word restore there, is to return to its original intent. When you say I restore something, you don't partly restore something. You return it to its original intent so that it looks exactly like it was meant to look before it was tarnished. So he restores my soul to return to original intent. Now, what does that mean with a sheep? How do you restore a soul of sheep? I've never had a sheep. I don't know about that, but I, I've researched sheep, and I've been to New Zealand, been to Australia. I've seen uh, uh, flocks of, I'll start to say herds, but that would be wrong, flocks of sheep. And, and, and I've talked to a few people that have shepherded sheep. And one of the things I really took to heart about restoring a whole is our soul, which fits in with David here. David knew how to restore the soul of a sheep. And guess how a shepherd would do that? It's called writing a cast sheep. You ever heard that term? It's a shepherd term and a sheep term used in third world countries that we know nothing about here because we, uh, we go to Kroger and get our sheep. That didn't fit. Anyway, so, but, but they would, they would ca casting a, uh, or excuse me, writing a cash sheep. Well, here's what a cash sheep meant. A cash sheep is a sheep that whose hair had gotten so, his wool had gotten so long. The wool had gotten so long, as they're walking in uneven places, they make missteps and they tumble over and they turn on their back, or usually their back or their side. Now, the sheep is so heavy with the, shorter legs, and with a hair that it can never right itself again to full position. Rarely does a sheep that has cast been cast down. That's why David said, oh, my soul, why? this is a shepherd saying, as a sheep, oh, my soul, why aren't thou cast down? In other words, I'm upside down. as a song, too. I'm upside down, and I can't get up, and I just can't. I'm going to die here. And in truth, a sheep that is cast uh, uh, because... They haven't been sheared properly. And by the way, you need to take that little correction from God and go ahead and get that wool off of you. But anyway, so they haven't been sheared enough, and they're carrying this weight and this burden of not having the shepherd shear them. And because they've strayed from the flock, and here they are upside down in the ditch, and here's the thing about the anatomy of a sheep. Their lungs were such a place that in 30 minutes to an hour, if they lay there, they would suffocate to death. They would fight, and they would try to, they could not turn over because of the heaviness of the sheep and because of the wool that was so heavy that hadn't been shorn. And they literally, you had just a short period of time to save that sheep's life. So what a good shepherd would do would go, as Jesus talked about, leave the 99 and go after the one cast sheep. We don't do that much anymore. But anyway, leave the 99 and go after the one cast sheep. And we would find the sheep he would do a procedure called writing, R-I-G-H-T, writing the sheep. And here's what he would do. If the sheep was not dead, he would go and grab the sheep by its wool. And sheeps are heavy, so it had to be a strong shepherd. And with all of his strength, he would yank that sheep and put his arms around that sheep, grab his wool, and get that sheep to stand on his legs. Could get his breathing back, could get his equilibrium back, because the sheep was just in moments or maybe an hour of dying from being cast down. And so the shepherd would take them and jerk them on his feet, and never a sheep would just start running at that time. It, would, it was a process, they say, of an hour or two, 
And the shepherd would take his leg and put it over like he would ride a horse, but he would put it over and he would hold the sheep so the sheep could stand up under the, under the embrace of the shepherd to get his breath back. I don't know if you can see this picture. And he's writing a cast sheep. He's not thinking about the 99 back there. He's thinking about the one that's about to die. He's writing him. He don't want to lose him. And every five or ten minutes, he would back up and let the sheep go. And if the sheep fell down again, he would do the same thing again. And he would keep giving equilibrium to the sheep in time until the sheep caught his breath enough that he could stand on his own feet. I'd walk. And then he would lead the sheep back to the herd. I just want to say to you, the Lord is a good shepherd. Some of you are cast down. I am cast down in a lot of ways. This world is cast down. But the good shepherd, if need be, he'll leave all 99 that are doing well because he's a shepherd that's looking for a cast sheep because he's forever touched with a feeling of the infirmity because every sheep, no matter how woolly or dirty or ugly they are, belong to him. And he will risk his life to right that sheep. No matter what you think about that sheep, well, look at them. They're out there. They shouldn't have done that. That's why they're in that problem right there. That's not what the shepherd does. So where were you at with that? Where were you cast down? Where do you feel like you can't take another breath? Where do you feel like you're alone and you can't write yourself? Be encouraged. The good shepherd is in the process right now of writing cast sheep all around this world. Right now. And you, although you would like for someone else to help with that, doesn't, he's alone. He is good enough. And when he does that, he takes the sheep back to the flock. I get through Matthew 18, 12. I give you scripture of that. It says a good shepherd will leave the 99 to go after the one that is lost. Get ready. The next revival, people say this all the time. It's about a lot of things. It is, but there's one thing for sure. The next revival is going to be about the lost sheep that the Lord is going to go after and bring back to the body of Christ. And you know what? You're going to be more spiritual than them, be more righteous than them, but not more loved. Because God and the shepherd is one. Let me say it again. He is not concerned about how many sheep are in his flock. He's concerned about the one that is cast down from wandering away from his touch as a shepherd. The Lord is about to make a move, a heart move on lost sheep. And they're going to come. Kids, nationalities, wherever, places in life, they're going to come from everywhere. And some of their wool is going to stink. Anyway, that's what happened to the Jesus movement if you were there. Crazy. By the way, I'll just say this. Our speaker last week, Steve, here, he, I think he said it so I can say that 41 years ago, Jesus saved him. He was a heroin addict in the Jesus movement. And while he was still just crazy heroin, he was called out in an auditorium and prophesied over 2,000 people and fell under the Spirit of God, shaken on the power of God. He would God do that to somebody on drugs? Apparently he did on a whole generation. Now he didn't say he can go ahead and do both, but he, but he weaned them from that. He righted them. Listen, God's not afraid of your stuff. He is not like, ooh, of all the stuff that's going on in your life. He's really not. He's a good shepherd. And no matter what condition you're in, his heart is to see that you are righted. Number three. Number four, excuse me. Yea, though I, this is a good one. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they do comfort me. Oh, do I love this one because I hate it. Because anything my flesh hates, I figure it's probably God. But I love this because I don't like it. I call it the I factor. In our journey with the Lord, we seem to always put all the onus on God. If we feel bad, it's God's fault. Where's the joy of the Lord? Where's the anointing you have? How come this door didn't open? How come that, you know, what if it's somewhat about you? In other words, what if it's somewhat about, let me just put this context. Yea, though, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I shall fear no evil. What if you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death? I don't know about you, but I think I've seen you there. Most of us are walking through some level of a valley 
where the long shadows are at, where the sun is setting, it's a valley of the shadow of death. It's called death because when the sun set in those days, predators would destroy or eat or kill the sheep. And maybe you're feeling like you're at the edge of that shadow, that you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. But the psalmist said, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now for the harder part of that. Not the theological part, but the Larry part. I call it the I walk factor. A couple of things you need to know about going through the valley of the shadow of death. One, he said, he didn't say, yea, though I run through the valley of the shadow of death. Whoops. Yea, though I get delivered out of the valley. Yea, though I get the deliverance ministry to take this thing out of me. Yea, though God will transport me to the next Enoch experience. Yea, the Lord will shorten this path. I'm in the valley of the shadow of death. I need an Enoch hijack. I need to get out of here. But David said, yea, though I, what? You should be, oh, what? Running. Yea, though I walk. It is not God's responsibility to run you through the valley of the shadow of death. It's your responsibility to walk through it. You will not get to your destination until you walk through your breakthrough. You cannot, you cannot blame anybody else. You cannot find anything in curriculum, Christian curriculum, Hardy, that can help you. You know what? It just means you just have to put one foot before the other. And it's terrible because we live in a miracle mindset that we want it now and we want it in 10 seconds. We want it delivered to our door or we quit. And this is not what's happening here. The sheep said, uh, David said, yea, though I walk, not run, because running creates stress on the body with risk of injury. By the way, if you're running too hard, you're probably going to hurt yourself. We need to stop it. Oh, I know it's dark and we want to get away from the position that we're in and the things that are around us, but how do we do it? Walking, you may get there slower, but with less injury. Larry, I'm talking to you, whoever's up there. I don't know. But it may be slower. It may not be what you want, but it, Scripture didn't say, so Enoch ran with God. doesn't say, well, Abraham ran. No, Abraham walked with God. Enoch, there's something about walking through the problem that you're in, walking through the season that you're in. This season that we're in, you're waiting for a miracle revival. We're waiting for a miracle revival, something to shift in the earth, and boom, it happens, and it's all over when God is trying to teach us how to walk through our opposition and fear no evil. Why? Because his rod and his staff comforts us. Newton's first law of motion is what? Objects in motion tend to stay in motion. If I could give you some advice, you don't need a miracle. You don't need someone to cast the devil out of you. you don't, I don't know that you need more uh, counseling. You just need to stay in motion. Whatever you do, I mean, it may be just one foot before the other. You may be making an inch at a time, but eventually if you stay in motion, you're going to get somewhere. And let me say it to you again. There's a table before you in the presence of your enemies over here, but you're not going to get there till you walk through this place to get there. God's not going to transport you to the table he has prepared for you in the wilderness until we learn how to walk through it. Newton's law of inertia. Do you know that one? You can only steer. You can only navigate things that are in motion. Oh, God, I don't know what's going on, but I quit. I'm sitting down right here. Well, you ain't going anywhere. You can only, God can only navigate, and you can only steer a ship. The rudder only works on a ship when the ship is in motion. So it don't have to be in fast motion, but at least like inch by inch would be nice. Because you know what? There is a, for, there is a for giving up spirit in the atmosphere in this nation. There is a giving up spirit in sitting down and just weeping in your own sorrow and blaming it on everybody else and just getting mad at God. It's there. It's, I don't know if you can feel it, but... It's in the atmosphere. It really is. And if you've not had that thought, you've probably got a lying spirit. I mean, I mean, look, because I thought, Lord, I don't want to be mad at you, but I think, I think I'm a little aggravated at you. I know that's not good. So I'll just keep walking. Because <laughs> if I ever sit down and think it through, I'm so in trouble. Even if it's baby steps. You've got to keep walking. We must walk through 
our breakthrough. What did God tell Israel when they went across the Jordan? Walk through this land. You can only possess what you have walked through. You can only possess and conquer what you have taken the time to diligently, step by step, walk through methodically. We, God help me, I love miracles and signs and wonders. I want to, but we are an over the top miracle, lazy bunch of Christians. We, we want it now. And we want cheese and tomatoes on the top of it. We want it in three seconds. And we want it through the drive through window with another miracle and move on in our life. And that's not the way it is. It's day to day, line upon line, precept on precept. Everything that God made grows except Christians. To some degree. I'm not talking about you or me. I'm talking about other people. Everything that God, he's a farmer. He's a God of growth. Sailor growth. Everything grows, and everything loves to grow, and everything has seasons, and everything God's made had winter seasons, so why are we afraid of it? Winter is what kills the bugs in the tree so they can have a better spring. I don't know about you, but I got some bugs on me. People even bug me. But what do you do in this time, and I'll move on, in this winter time that we're in, what does a tree do when its leaves are leaving and it's gone? And it's winter, you have one thing, you, you just, just keep those branches up in there. They're ugly, there's not any leaves on them, but you've got to reach heavenward or heavenward and continue to hope against hope that no matter how cold the winter is, spring always comes. Your winter is an absolute prophetic word that springs next. If you don't believe that, <laughs> you're a dead tree. Number five, got to go quicker. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Ooh, do I like this one. Ooh, I'm going to hurt someone on this one. I'm going to hurt myself on this one. I don't want to say this. I don't even believe that I want to say that. I'm going to say this. You prepare a table before me. What, God's what? Preparing? I thought it should be prepared. You're what? You're preparing a table before me in the presence of my enemies. What does it mean you're preparing a table? Can I say again? We're fast food Christians. We're drive through mentality. We want it now, and we want whipped cream on top of it, or we're backsliding. I find someone else to blame it on. I get them fired. Whoever Whoever's preaching that, say, they're, they're done. They, you didn't pull me up to where I need to be, or whatever consolation we think we need. A gourmet, a gourmet, sorry, get this. If there's a table spread and it's on his table, he's probably a gourmet chef, wouldn't you think? If you're going to have something called the Great Supper of the Lamb, it's probably not just Burger King. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. A gourmet chef, to a gourmet chef, I hear, and I'm not one, preparation and presentation are one of the most important part of any meal. Oh, I'm going to hurt you. Do you mind? If I crack some, crack some knuckles? We do not like preparation or presentation. We just want to gouge or gorge on the food. Our problem is not a lack of provision as a church. Our problem is a lack of patience with the preparation process that God has promised us. He's a chef, and it takes him quite a while to get the meal right, and we're banging on the table, what now, 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 now? And we'll eat anything as long as it's now. I say we, I'm talking metaphorically. I knew that wasn't going to go over. But think about that for just a minute. What if the place that we're in is a place that God has put us in, where he's preparing a table before him, and as a gourmet chef, he's in the process of preparation and presentation for a table spread like we've never seen before, and we're impatient with the chef time he's taking to make us the best meal we could ever imagine in our life. That is dumb. But our spiritual stomach is growling. Well, it doesn't matter. No. We have to be patient with that. And get this, since that didn't work. In the presence, and he prepares a table before me 
in the presence of my enemies? What? Your enemies you're washing? Yes. Here's what I think about that. The most threatening weapon against the kingdom of darkness, the most threatening weapon you have in your armory against the kingdom of darkness is a complete and mature preparation process in your life. But we just can't, or I can't, like I can't wait. I just can't wait anymore. I'll eat anything. I can't, God, give me, I don't care. Give me just a little angel vitamin. I'm, I'm done. I've got to do with that. I'll do anything. A feather, a wing, whatever. It doesn't matter. The most threat, in the presence of his enemies, he prepares a mature preparation that's wonderful, but it takes time. And I don't know if you know it, there's a song written about that because time is on his side. Yes, it is. It is not on our side. He's an eternal God who lives in a time frame, but time means little to him and too much to us sometimes. Oh, boy. Still in verse 5, this is going to be even harder. He anoints my head with oil. He anoints my head with oil. Hmm. Boy, did I get a rude awakening about that one when the Lord visited me eight years ago. Because I always thought if God's going to anoint your head with oil, there are five ingredients in the anointing oil in the tabernacle, by the way, which are myrrh, cinnamon, calamus, cassia, and olive oil. And they were anointing of oil, and Aaron, our other prophets, a priest, were anointed with this five ingredient anointing oil to qualify them as having the oil of God, the presence of God on the head for leadership. But it had other, it had other properties that are connected to shepherding sheep that you probably don't know about that I found out about because the Lord visited me and just scared the bejeebies out of me with it not that long ago. When a, why would a shepherd anoint his sheep with oil. It's like, okay, I'm going to anoint your head with oil, and now you're going to be an elk and minister all over the world. No. Why does a sheep need their head? And we, they don't. So you've got to catch the metaphor here. We're talking about sheep and shepherd. This is about sheep and shepherd. So David is speaking from the perspective of a sheep. He's the sheep. So what is it about anointing? Especially the eyes, the ears, and nose. What is it about all of that? I've said it to you before. If you weren't here, you'll hear it again shortly in a short version. When the Lord visited me about Psalms 23 over a period of a week's time, one of the last things he did to me was 1 o'clock in the morning at the foot of my bed, and I knew intuitively that he was going to anoint me with oil because he had a flask under his arm, in his right arm. And I knew that in those days they had a flask of oil, and they would that flask and they would anoint with oil. Well, I was ready. I thought, my gosh, I'm going to have the next super minister in the world. Like, man, I'm going to be, whoo. I, I didn't think that. You know, your flesh sort of leans that way. I'm all that in a glass of Kool-Aid here in about 10 minutes because, like, I'm out. I'm out of here. And, like, somebody stop me. I mean, I'm gone. But, boy, was I in for a shock. He leans over, grabs me by the hair of my head. That's why I still have it because that's the way he disciplines grabs me by the hair of my head and jerks my head back and starts pouring this oil up both nostrils and in my mouth. And I thought I was going to die. I'm, I'm choking and I'm thinking, what? My mind is right. What is going on here? And when I can't breathe anymore, the Lord spoke to me and he says, I'm detoxing you from a religious spirit. I'm detoxing you from a spirit of religion. I go, I don't know exactly what that means. The infection. So here's what a shepherd would do to a sheep that the Lord did to me that I didn't see coming. Because I expected an elevated prophetic ministry, a new healing gift, and a new place to preach. Oh, no. This anointing, this, this shepherd knows how to anoint a sheep for their benefit. 
So here's what the shepherd would do in those days. The sheep would get infection from flies and gnats and mosquitoes, especially flies. And flies would get up the sheep's nose and lay eggs in their nose. They would get in their ears and lay eggs in their ears. And sometimes they would consume them. It caused them to be very sick. So a good shepherd, when he saw a sick sheep, he would have to detox. He would take the oil. And by the way, we have five senses that are sometimes affected. There were five ingredients for the anointing oil I talked to you about. That's interesting, Exodus chapter 28. But he would take the anointing oil, and he would pour it up the sheep's nose. And it would, the sheep had to be feel like he was dying. And he would pour it up his nose, and it would kill the flies. Who's the god of the... Anyway, we don't go there. But it would kill the flies and the bugs and the infection in the sheep's five senses. Don't ask God to do that to you. It's not fun. And I'm still getting over it. I'm still hacking. Okay. And he would do that. He would lift their head and pour it there. And it would take a long time for them to recover. But when they recovered, and their recovery was better than the outcome, which was death within usually 30 days. I don't know how to say this except say it to me because this was not meant for you. The Lord said this to me. Larry, I'm going to detox you from you. I'm going to detox you from a spirit of religion, are just the, how do you say it, not just the spirit of religion, but the infection of mere religion. Just the structure, not the life. You got flies up your nose. You got bugs in your ear. You've been infected because that's what the enemy does for a living, is to try to infect Jesus' sheep. That's why he's called the God of the fly. They lay eggs in places they shouldn't. This is going different than I thought. But anyway, what you're feeling, let me put it in a softer context and we're ending here. What you're feeling perhaps could be a detox you're going through. It's not fun. But you know, I've never been through one in the natural, but I've had people try to tell me about going through de they detox with certain things in their life. And they've always said, it was, I thought I was dying and after 30 days. The infection was gone, and I feel like a new person. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Have you ever been through a detox or known anybody through a detox that has said, I don't know, boy, that was tough, but boy, I'm glad I did it after it was over. This nation, the church in this nation, our lives, this world, in my opinion, is going through a religious detox so the Spirit of God can rest upon us in a new way. And it's not just the form of religion and denying the power thereof. But it is true religion, which is Christ himself and the power of God and the living presence of our shepherd in and out of our lives. Wouldn't it be good to do what Ephesus were called to do, return to our first station, our first love? That's what's happening, in my opinion, that he loves us enough to detox us from a premature spiritual death that we can't see coming because our five senses are polluted by religion. Okay. One more piece on that one because that's all in verse 5. My cup runneth over. Oh, have you been praying for a full cup? Got to get rid of the flies first. Notice the progression. First, he anoints my head with oil. And then, he says, my cup runneth over. This has all happened at the table, prepared for him, that he's gotten to after walking through the valley of the shadow of death. You think when you get there, God would do something better, but it's like it gets worse. But the end is good. My cup runneth over. That's it. My cup runneth over. In Eastern culture of that day, hospitality was a term of this, this nation. When you were sitting at a king's table, if you were sitting at a noble's table, and you were there for the first time, perhaps, and nobody knew what kind was going on with you or with the, or with the noble or the king, uh, whether they received you or not or liked you or not, 
or they wanted you to stay, one of, the, one of the signs, if they liked you and they wanted you to stay or spend the night, is when the servant went out, they would tell them, fill their cup to running over. If your cup was only half full, it's like you'd be staying at Hotel 6 that night. But if your cup was running over, that was a sign from the noble or the king or the wealthy person's house that you're in that he had enough wine to waste it to pour it over. Your cup runs over. That is a signature, or a, a sign, excuse me, a signature sign from that person that you're accepted and you can spend the night. My cup runneth over. It spills out. It is... And it says the principle of displacement. And by the way, as a side, an aside, what I'm saying, we're also struggling with the principle of displacement. The only way to get water out of a out of a out of a vessel, and by the way, we're vessels of God and we have water. The only way to get stagnant water out is not to kill the vessel or turn it over, is to pour pure water and displace the other water. You're in and I are in a season of God displacing the bad water in our vessel with his water. And it's not fun. Because you've already been going through a detox, plus the valley of the shadow of death, and go, Lord, I signed up for a good time. <laughs> this is the day that the Lord has made. Boy, we knew what that meant. The day of the Lord meant destruction. You know, <laughs> this is, I don't know. I will jump like David jump. I go, I don't remember David jumping, but I got tired of those songs after a while. And then I sang this one, fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. I thought, no, my cup should run over. We've had a full cup. It's been good. That's fine. But the principle of displacement means that God is not going to long, no longer deal with our cup. He's going to produce a river in our life. A cup is static. Water in the sky. A pond is static. A lake is static. We're not a lake. We're not a cup. We're, we're not a pond. We are a river. Because Jesus said to one woman in the well, include, that included all of us, for out of your belly shall be a cup. No. For out of your innermost being shall be a river of living water. Revelation said, and there flowed from the throne of God a river of living water that was for the healing of the nations. I am uncomfortable and dissatisfied with a cup of water. I want a river because a river is active and overflowing and ever progressing. It ties in with the book, uh, uh, Paul's writings, for we are being transformed into his image from glory to glory. In other words, from overflow to overflow, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. It's linear in its flow. A cup is static, a pond is static, just an experience with God is ecstatic. No, we don't just want a standalone cup of experience with God. We want to walk in that river. We want not just a cup. We want a cup that turns into a river and runs over into a river. And by the way, don't mean to hurt your feelings with this one, but I'm going to. A water, a river, one cubit of water in a river that is fluid, fluid and that is active and overflowing, never passes the same piece of ground twice. It's linear and it's eternal, and it goes from glory to glory. When a cubit of water comes down a river, it doesn't try to get back to the way it used to be. It doesn't try to get back to that place it passed up. It has new territory and new flow every day of its life. That's why the prophet Isaiah says, Behold, there's going to come a day for my people when I'm going to do a new thing. And every day, I'm going to renew my joy. I'm going to renew their joy. And it's going to be a new thing. And suddenly shall it spring forth while well, you not know it. We're in for a ride and a half if we can get through this place. And what we thought we wanted to get back to, we never want to touch again. He's taken us to new places, glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We live in circles and boxes, and we should be living in linear lines. We live in boxes of denominationalism or circles of Pentecostalism when God is neither in a box or doesn't own boxes or doesn't have circles. He is light, and light travels at 186,000 miles per second. That's linear. That's fast. If you're waiting on God, you've got a problem. He's so far ahead of us. We have to flow. 
We have to flow. We have to go. We cannot be recovered the same old ground over and over. A river never passes the same place twice. I don't know how to say that, except we are transformed into his image from glory to glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. John, again, 738 said, out of your belly shall flow. It doesn't go back in your belly. Where's that gift again? Where is it? Oh, it shall flow. Every morning, he renews, makes things new. Last, I didn't say that like I wanted to say it, but I said it well enough to get you interested. I will, I, will, I will end it by saying this. Stop trying to get back to the future. Stop trying to revisit. Remember Lot's wife. Don't look back. Look, at, look to where you're going, not where you've been. You can't. You can't try to get back. I do not want to revisit the Jesus movement. I do not want to revisit the faith movement. I do not want to revisit Azusa Street. I do not want a 15th century Bible. I want something that has never lived before. I want to see something that I have never seen before. Because I'm a river. I am not a cup that recaptures old water. That's tomb focus. I am womb focus. In other words, reborn, rebirth, renaissance. comes from the French word meaning to birth new. Revival comes from a word meaning to raise something that used to live. I'm not into raising the dead. I'm into something that's never lived before. I don't know if you're going to go with me, but I'm going there. I've never seen it. I have never seen or ears ever heard those things God has prepared for us. So we've got to quit trying to redig the old wells of what God used to be like or what we've experienced. And we've got to go into a renaissance mode and see something new and wonderful that has never lived before. I want it. That's why I saw when I saw the little kids go, that's what I'm talking about. What church have you ever been to do, do people go to to have little children lay hands on for miracles and healings and signs and wonders? Let it be here, God. Let it be. Let it be new. I am old, aggravated. I won't do. I'm bored. I'm bored with just another redo. I'm bored with that. Okay, last. Surely goodness and mercy, verse 6, shall follow me all the days of my life. David said, if I walk down this linear path that I just described, if I, if I hit all the high points here, if I go through this and this process took him years, he says, okay, now that I've done that, I'm going to close by saying this. You know what? This qualifies me for something, goodness and mercy. I don't know about you, but I can stand some goodness and mercy. I have plenty from God. I can just stand it from you better and you from me. We need to, we need to, we need to, see, we put that on God. Surely goodness and mercy should follow. Well, you know what? It, God has already poured out his goodness and mercy, and we're handlers of that. We should be now brokers in goodness and mercy. Well, Jesus will. Well, Jesus will love them because they're hard to love. Well, that's what he made you for. His hands extended. Goodness and mercy shall follow all the days of my life. He meant it shall follow me, but I shall also be the dispenser of goodness and mercy. And you see him do it with a man, Saul, who tried to kill him. He served with all of his heart and love and honor to a man that was trying to kill him. And when he had a chance to kill Saul and take his place in his ministry, he said, I would never touch God's anointed ever. I either have my own path, I will not copy art. Looking for the right word. Take hostage, someone else's anointing, authority, power. I don't know about you, but I want my own thing. You don't need to be me. I don't need to be you. We need to be body in particular. Okay. Goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. The word follow is a Hebrew word that means to chase or pursue. I like that. Not just follow, but there's a difference between follow and pursue in the English language. Follow means that you reluctantly follow behind. Pursue means with passion and a passionate heart, you chase something. He said, that goodness and mercy shall chase me. 
One translation says, shall track me down like a hunter tracks his prey. I love that. I don't know about you, but I could stand a tablespoon of goodness and mercy. It would be nice. A drink of it. I, I don't have to have it from God. I'd take it from you. And you should take it from That's what we're here for. I mean, we just need, we need that. His love, his love will never fail to chase us. The only problem is disguised in other people. You've been asking God, where'd you go? What happened to you? He hides himself in other people. His love will never fail to chase us. We just don't recognize it when we see it. We are being hunted by his unfailing and unfailing love. We're being silently hunted by the love of God. I'll end with this. I grew up in Arkansas hunting. Do you know what still hunting is? You ever heard the term still hunting? If you have, you raise your hand, you're a hillbilly. But I grew up there still hunting. Still hunting meant you don't have a dog and you don't have somebody to track. We're still hunting was you go into the woods and you be as quiet as you can be so that whether it be rabbits, squirrels, or deer, your hunting cannot detect your presence in the woods. I've sat as a young man under a tree, squirrel hunting. You can't move. I've sat there for two hours in the morning with the sun break, waiting because they never knew. They're unsuspecting because I am still. I can hardly breathe. I'm still hunting. Here's what I mean by that. You may not feel it or sense it. You may not know it. But the love of God, his unfailing love, is hunting you in a still, small voice and still hunting. And you don't even know you're being pursued by God. And I, said last one, will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and forever. We're all going to die. The question is where and with whom. Will that be with? And what place will we have? Wow, it's only 1158. That's great. But I want to encourage you in that. How can how do I say it in the South? It ain't over till it's over. And as far as I'm concerned, it ain't over. It feels like it is to me. Anything past 50 was like I thought was over. But, but it's like, it feels like it's all over. And people give me prophetic words. Oh, you've only just begun. It's not over for you. And I go, I hear you, but I don't know if I believe you. Because it's, my feelings tell me something different. But here's what I do know. God's promise to us is not predicated on our feelings or what we call success or not success. His love for us is enduring and everlasting and he is going to see to it that you and I reach the richness and the fullness of the investment he has placed in us to be the people of God. He has called us to be, or if not, we'll die and he'll raise up another generation. I prefer being that generation. I prefer that. That when the Lord looks down from heaven, Revelation, and he said, the bride, oh my, has made herself ready. Somebody stop me because I'm coming down to take her home. And she has her makeup on. She's dressed. She's perfect. She's like, that. I want to be that. Don't you want to be that generation that is so beautiful, that is a bride so properly dressed and so wonderfully put together and so alluring that the Lord can't, is going to return, not because the book of Revelations gives out some time to return, but because he can't stand to be away from you one day long. Wouldn't that be great? Come, that's why the scripture says, come Lord Jesus. For the bride, when is, when is Jesus coming back? I know. I can write a whole book. I'm thinking about doing it. When, I know when Jesus is coming back. It's in the Bible. When the bride has made herself ready, that's the end of my book. It's, 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 why are we writing all these books about eschatology? And that, this, that, that? No, he's coming back when his church is so alluring to him, when he's so attractive to him, when we're so cleaned up, when we're so that beautiful bride, 
that he just can't stand to be separate from us a day long. So, we are commanded to pray, come Lord Jesus. That could be second coming or that could be a coming of a new era or new move of God as well. So I'm going to pray for you and, um, and I want to pray for me. And if you want to be involved in that, that's fine. But I need to pray for me and I hope the overflow is for you. And I just want to speak to the heavens and speak to my beloved shepherd. He loves me. I just cannot ever forget that night where he showed to me and he said, Larry, I thought he was going to give me a vision or a revelation. He said, I just wanted to come to tell you I still love you. I've always loved you, and I'll still love you. And wow, that's a long trip to say that, Lord. You must really feel that. And in spite of that, I still doubt him because we're so pathetic sometimes, or I am, in believing what God tells us. But, Father, we thank you for the enduring love of God. We thank you for this valley of the shadow of death that has so, so trapped us as a nation, as a people, as your sheep. And Lord, has cast sheep upside down without any breath left in us, feeling like it's over and done. Will I ever be and do what you've called me to do? Will I ever get right side up again? I'm upside down in every area. I'm alone. Lord, all the cash sheep that are in your flock, Lord, we cry out for those. May the good shepherd, may you straddle us, may you hold us, may you write us, may you stay as long as it takes for us to catch our breath so that we can walk on our own and return to your flock. Lord, we believe you're the good shepherd and we cry out to you. You're the love of our soul. You are the firstborn among many brethren. You are the God of gods. You died for us. You put down everything for us. We're a prize to you. We're a prize to you. And you forever live to make intercession for us and are forever touched with every alley, with every ouch, with every feeling, with every infirmity that we have. The Lord, we know that about you. We're not asking for you to do anything different. We're asking for you to detox us from the poison of numbness so that we can feel what is really right and really true about you. So, Lord, pour on us a sense of grace. Pour out upon this nation. Pour out upon our lives hope that is not deferred, but hope that rejoices that at night a woman is in travail, but in the morning a child is born and joy is in the air. Lord, bring us to that place so our hope is big in our heart. And so we declare that, God, you're doing a new thing. A baby is going to be born. Something is coming. Something is right here. Do not let us fall short of the goal line in the last few yards of the race that we're on. Help us to pass through this valley of the shadow of death. Help us to get through this squeeze that we're in, this sense of losses, this sense of, of of no context, this sense of no situational awareness about where we're at. Give us direction. Give us a sense a divine embrace. No, I know you've given it. Lord, let us feel it. That's it. Lord, heal our numb feelers. Heal our hearts. Heal the callousness of our faith. Heal us so that we're sensitive to even the slightest touch of your spirit so that we feel your heart and your concern in your divine grace. Lord, forgive us for doubting that you love us. Forgive us for doubting that you're our shepherd and that we're the sheep of your pasture and you take that serious and you are going to lead us into green pastures and lead us beside clear waters and still, still washers. And Lord, we believe that because you said that and because you love us. We love you, but you love us even more. And your love is sufficient. For no greater love hath any man than to lay down his life for his sheep, for his people. And you have done that. And we reciprocate this morning. And we lift our hands to you and say, Lord, thank you, good shepherd. 
you will never take more wool off of us than we can stand and let us freeze to death in this thing called distress of life. You're a good shepherd. And if we fall down, you will right us and you will take us back to our place of promise and our place of care for you. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love who you are. And we love the shepherd that you are. And we love the journey that you've been on to find us and to right us and to stand us upright. Lord, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. We remember who you are this morning, the good shepherd for this nation, the good shepherd for our lives, the good shepherd for this world. We remember you, Lord, this morning. We say, good shepherd, we are the sheep of your pasture. We are the sheep of your pasture, and we love you. Thank you.